the teaching on the three characteristics or the three perceptions, inconstancy, stress, not self. occupies a peculiar place in the Buddhist teachings. It's always true, but it's not always beneficial. That means it's not categorical. The Buddha didn't apply it all the time. In fact, there are a couple of cases in the canon where monks try to apply it and the Buddha reprimands them for it. In one case, a monk tries to argue from the principle that all feelings are stressful to say that all actions lead to stress. The Buddha reprimands him. It says when you're talking about karma, talking about action, you talk about three kinds of feeling. There are pleasant feelings, and painful ones, and feelings that are neither pleasant nor painful. And it's obvious that here that applying the three perceptions is a mistake, because if you said everything you do is going to lead to stress, there would be no incentive to try to do anything skillful. And if there's no incentive to do anything skillful, then you're going against one of the Buddha's actual categorical teachings, which is you could try to develop what's skillful and abandon what's not. The reason being that developing skillful actions is going to lead to long-term welfare and happiness. There's another case where a monk tried to argue that if all the aggregates are not self, then what self is there to do the actions, and what self is there going to be to receive the results of actions? That's a license for irresponsible behavior. There's nobody there responsible, nobody going to be affected by the actions, so you can do what you want. Here again, the Buddha reprimands the monk and says that's the wrong application of the teaching. So it's not to be applied at all times. I know some people who've argued from the three characteristics that we have no free will, or that we have no choices in the present moment. Whatever's going to come up in the present moment is just going to come up willy-nilly, regardless of what you want. And that, as the Buddha pointed out, would make the whole idea of following a path of practice be nonsense, because how could you choose to follow the path? So you have to be careful in how you apply these teachings. There's a right time and a right place, and a wrong time and a wrong place. This line of thinking may have been behind the John Lee's ways of talking about the three characteristics. So sometimes he talks about things being inconstant, stressful, and not self. And also there's another side, which is constant, easeful, and self. Or sometimes he phrases it as inconstant, stressful, and not under control, and the other side is constant, easeful, and under control. Now he ends up by saying that you have to end up by abandoning both sides. And it's good to look at the context, because he's meaning two different things in the two spots where he talks about this. In the first instance, he's talking about the practice of concentration. You're taking the breath, you're taking your sense of the body as you feel from within. And as you start out, you notice it's inconstant, stressful, and there's a lot of things going on there that you don't control. But you're going to try to work with the breath so it does become more constant. The mind in its concentration becomes more constant. There's a sense of ease in body and mind, and you gain some mastery over it. Now, eventually, you're going to have to let go of the concentration. After all, it is part of the path. It's that part of the raft that's going to take you across that you don't have, then have to leave behind. But if you try to practice without the concentration, and this is what I think John Lee is getting at, the people want to go straight for insight. Then they haven't mastered an important part of the path. They start out with inconstant, stressful, not self, and then any attempts to develop concentration they see as going against the nature of reality. So they actually describe concentration as an unnecessary part of the path, or even an illegitimate part of the path.
And I've seen cases of people developing the three characteristics and they get extremely depressed. Again, thinking there's nothing they can do to change unpleasant things coming up. They abdicate power because they've been told they have no power. It's like the dogs in those learned helplessness experiments where they're put in a room, the first room, where wherever they lie down on the floor they get shocks. And they try to avoid the shocks, but after a while they realize they can't, so they give up and just lie there. And then they're taken to a second room where half the floor was giving shocks and the other half was not. And the researchers would drag the dogs back and forth so they would know which side of the floor gave shocks and which one didn't. But the dogs had gotten to, so used to expecting the idea that there would be shocks at some point that they gave up trying. So just focusing on the three characteristics without having a sense of concentration to underlie it, without having mastered the concentration to fight against them to see exactly how far they go, can end up being very fatalistic. So as we're sitting here focusing on the breath, we are actually fighting against the three characteristics. Because only when you push against them do you really know how far they're true and how far they're not. But as John Lee says, eventually you're going to have to let go of the concentration that is constant, easeful, and under your control. That's one of his discussions. The other one has to do more with insight. He talks about how you develop the insight into things being in constant stressful, not self. And it's very easy for the mind to hold on to that insight as a permanent thing. And there's a certain pleasure that comes with that. You've got something you can hold on to, it's solid, that makes you impervious to the ups and downs of the world. Just as the Buddha makes a distinction between dependent core arising and dependently core arisen phenomena, the dependently core arisen phenomena change all the time. The principle of dependent core arising is constant. You can hold on to this insight and you can use it to pry away your attachments to lots of things. But you have to remember ultimately that these insights too are perceptions. Now, the Buddha never called them three characteristics, they're three perceptions. And as he said, perceptions, no matter how perceptive they may be, are essentially empty, void, devoid of substance. You compare them to mirages. They look like something solid, but when you actually get there, they disappear. But the whole purpose of the path is to find something that does have essence. And so it's important that you not mistake the insight for the goal. This again is something that happens in some insight circles. They say that when you finally see that there is no self, that's when you've reached the first level of awakening. Where you've mistaken a perception for something that is, should be beyond perceptions. So even though the insights may be true about all fabrications, there comes a point where you have to let them go as well. Otherwise, you suffer from what are called the corruptions of insight, where you latch on to some experience or some insight. Think you've reached the goal, and you're blind to the fact that you're still latching on. So even though the principle of these three characteristics applying to all fabricated things, may be true. There's a time where you have to let it go. That's where John Lee says you have to let go of both constant and inconstant, stressful and easeful, self and not self. It's only then that the mind is free. So it's important to see these perceptions as tools. They have their time and their place, but there's also a time and place to put them down.
and so should always heed the warnings of the Ajahns. That even when you're right, if you hold on to your rightness at the wrong time, it becomes wrong. And watch out specifically for applying a teaching in the wrong way that gets in the way of the practice. Anything that denies the power of choice goes against one of the basic principles that underlies everything we're doing as we practice. And any idea that you're going to be arriving at right view. helps prevent you get to the end. Right view is part of the raft. The further shore is something else entirely. And that's where we want to go.